just kind of brief overview of where we're headed today. First, I'm going to try to convince you why this is an issue you should care about. Then we're going to talk about what makes flooding in California and the West Coast generally different from other places in the U.S. A lot of that difference is driven by atmospheric rivers, so we're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about how atmospheric rivers are changing in a warming climate. And then lastly, we're going to talk about my research, which has to do with the damage due to flooding that's driven by atmospheric rivers. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia. I did my undergrad at Northeastern in Boston, and I came here in the fall of 2018. I majored in civil engineering in undergrad, but I was always kind of more interested in how cities functioned as a whole and how they responded to system shocks instead of just individual buildings. And so I did research related to water and power utility networks and how those could recover better from hurricanes and earthquakes. And then I also spent a year working for an insurance company pricing risk for buildings and properties exposed to hurricanes and earthquakes across the country. Also at that company, I worked on building a custom in-house tornado model. So we made our own model for how tornadoes affected buildings, which is pretty cool. Now, like Rajita said, I'm in the Stanford Urban Resilience Initiative, which is based out of the Bloom Earthquake Center. And the goal of the Stanford Urban Resilience Initi Initiative is to bring together engineers, community planners, emergency managers, and work toward creating more resilient communities. So Stanford is more known kind of for its earthquake research, at least in my department. Why did I get into flooding? So <laughs> here's a picture of me in high school with my brother in our backyard of the house I grew up in. And that is that like pile of water is our storm drain that was in the middle of our backyard. And uh, my mom made us come inside quite soon after taking this picture because the water was rising pretty rapidly. But this was not super abnormal. We had a hurricane or we had a flash flood or some kind of major rain event, I would say once every year or two. So this was something that I definitely was familiar with, had experience with growing up. And then the other thing is that whenever I have a free weekend, I love to run away and go whitewater kayaking. And so the top picture is me on my home river in Richmond, and the one with the orange helmet, like the third one back. And then the bottom picture is me on the Feather River in Northern California this past fall. So when you're physically in the rivers that you're studying as much as I am, it really feels a lot more personal. And so I've always very been, really been into water and kind of water related research. And you're like, all right, that's fine, but I don't kayak, so why do I care? Uh, California is much more known for its wildfires and its droughts. Is flooding really a big issue? I mean, you're not, you're not wrong. California does get very extreme droughts. I don't know how many of you were here four years ago. I was not, but I know I heard on the news about how bad the drought was in California. On the left, you can see how the, the map of the dark red and angry brown of how extreme the drought was throughout the state. And then the picture on the right is Folsom Lake, which is a major reservoir just east of Sacramento. It's dry, it's, it's bad. But one year later, the drought is over. It is completely wiped out. There's almost nothing left in the colors on the map. And then this is Folsom Lake again, one year later, completely full with one tiny little boat for scale. The Sierra Nevada snowpack went from 5% of the annual average to 180% of the annual average in one year. That is an insane amount of water. So obviously not all of it went into Folsom Lake. Where did it go? Some of it went into rivers. So here's the South Yuba River at flood stage. But a lot of it did not stay in the rivers. And so it flooded communities near rivers and far away from rivers completely flooded beyond the floodplain, and even the infrastructure that was designed to take the water sometimes couldn't. So here's Oroville Dam. For the very first time in its 40 year history in 2017, they had to use their emergency spillway to let off excess water because there was too much water behind the dam. The emergency spillway immediately started eroding. There was risk of the dam collapsing and they had to evacuate the whole town. So hopefully I've convinced you that Flooding is something that happens in California. It's real, it's something we should talk about, and it's something we should prepare for. So 
what's unique about California flooding? How is it different than, say, Texas or Louisiana or Florida? And the main answer to that is variation and variability. We're going to talk about three main types of variation. The first one of these is seasonal variation. So California has a pretty distinct wet season and dry season. And so our wet season goes from October to about March or April. And we call that one water year. So the 2020 water year actually started in October of 2019, and it's going to go through March or April of 2020, just to kind of smash the, the times where it's wet together into one cohesive unit. And so this graph shows the average daily precipitation average over the month. So each gray line is one year in this 40-year record, and then the black line is average. So on average, January gets three inches of day every day, average over the month. Obviously, it doesn't generally rain every day in January, but that's just the flat average. In contrast, I think it rained 0 0.01 inches total in the whole 40 record in July, the 40 year record. So that's kind of a pretty extreme difference in the amount of precipitation we get. But even though it never rains in the summer here, we still need water. So that leads to some water resource and management issues for the state. Next up, we're going to talk about regional variation. So this is a picture from January 1st, so halfway through the 2020 water year, and the chance that we're going to reach 100% or average precipitation. So Southern California is doing pretty well. They kind of got dumped on in November and December, and so they're already at 100% of their normal water or precipitation totals for this wet season. Northern California, on the other hand, we've had a pretty dry year and it's pretty much going to stay dry. There's very little precipitation to forecast for the rest of February. And so we have about a 30% chance of reaching normal water totals this year. We're on track for a pretty dry year here in Northern California, but obviously it varies pretty, pretty substantially throughout the state. Lastly, we're going to talk about interannual variation. So that's the difference between a dry season and a wet season. And it's really hard to predict that in advance, which one it's going to be, even though that's super important information. So there's a couple different global climate forcings that can contribute to this interannual variation. I'm going to talk about one of them, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's this current thing that happens uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, but it has global effects. And so it changes cycles every couple of years between La Nina, which is a cold cycle, neutral, and El Nino, which is a warm cycle. So this map is looking at flood damages based on which cycle you fall into. Red means that you have more damages, kind of more flooding than you expect for that year. Blue means that you have less damages than an average year. And so in the La Nina cycle, in the cold cycle, the Pacific Northwest gets hit pretty hard. They get more water than they do in an average year and Southern California is generally pretty dry. And then on the other side of the spectrum, in El Nino years, the Pacific Northwest doesn't really flood very much at all. They have lower damage than average, and Southern California gets hit really hard. Here in Northern California, there's no clear pattern. We kind of get hit from both directions. It's not very predictable at all based on El Nino or La Nina. So that's just one of kind of a bunch of different things going on that can contribute to this interannual variation. And so what's driving all of this crazy variability? The answer is pretty much unequivocally atmospheric rivers. Atmospheric rivers are horizontal bands of water transport in the atmosphere that carry moisture from the tropics to the mid-latitudes where we are. So you can see this one in particular, this one that affects the west coast, is called the uh, Pineapple Express because it carries moisture from Hawaii to the West Coast. And just to give you a scale of these things, they're generally, so the Amazon River is the, by volume, the largest river in the world. An average normal atmospheric river carries about double what the Amazon does. A extreme atmospheric river can carry up to six times what the Amazon does. There is a huge amount of moisture in these things. They're generally a couple miles wide, over a thousand miles long, and they can hit this particular storm pattern that we tend to get hit with 
can hit anywhere from, say, Southern California to Southern Canada. And it's just like wide swing. And so one of the kind of climate things driving this is that there's two main pressure systems in the Pacific Ocean or in the Northern Pacific Ocean. On the bottom, this way, we have the Pacific High System turning this way. And then there's the Aleutian Low turning this way. So it just creates this conveyor belt of moisture that hits us pretty hard over and over all winter long. So those are atmospheric rivers. In terms of environmental, I guess, events or phenomena that we study and research and follow, atmospheric rivers are pretty new to the scene. The term was first coined in the 1990s. The main measure that we use to measure the intensity of these things is called IVT, it's Integrated Water Vapor Transport. It's just basically how much water is moving horizontally through a vertical column of the atmosphere. The tools we use to measure IVT were first used in 2016. So we don't have, uh, we have like a, people have looked back at the record and done their best to identify historic atmospheric rivers, but in terms of measuring these things as they happen, we've only been doing that since 2016. And the very first category intensity rating scale was released less than a year ago. I think it was February of last year. So they're pretty new to the scene research-wise. And this intensity scale rates atmospheric rivers both on the IVT I mentioned and on how long they last. And they range from weak, which is categorized as a primarily beneficial storm, to exceptional, which is a primarily hazardous storm. And so I just want to take a minute. There are not many kind of things we consider to be disasters that can also be primarily beneficial. Uh, so there are good things that come out of atmospheric rivers. They're responsible for a third to half of California's water supply. They're drought busters. So 2017, even though the magnitude of that swing was pretty large, it was kind of ca characteristic or textbook that it would kind of ease into the drought and then whoop, we're out of it. Like we never really ease out of a drought. It's kind of like dry, 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 bam, tons of water. And that's uh, due to atmospheric rivers. And then they also, you know, keep the water cycle flowing, keep ecological diversity. But there's only about 10 to 20 of these storms that hit California every year. So if there's only 10 to 20 storms and they're contributing up to half of our water supply, think about how much water each individual storm carries. And so one to two storms can be the difference between an unusually dry or an unusually wet year. And so they're a huge contributor to that variability that I talked about earlier. They also tend to dump their rain in these really intense three to five day bursts. And so they're responsible for the vast majority of flooding events in the state. So we got you know a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. They're necessary, but the way that they distribute their water sometimes leads to consequences when they overflow the system. And then lastly, how are atmospheric rivers going to change and how is kind of California's climate and water cycle gonna change generally in a warming climate? First of all, we can expect our wet seasons to start starting later. And this wet season, the 2020 water year is an excellent example of that. It didn't rain through all of October. That's you know, a little odd, but still pretty normal. It continued to not rain until almost the end of November, and that is very abnormal. We kind of caught back up because it rained a ton over Thanksgiving weekend, or week, but we're still on track for a pretty dry year. That's the beginning of the season. At the end of the season, we can expect kind of more storms later as well, which will lead to more rain on snow events. When it rains on the snowpack in California's mountains, it melts that snowpack, and you get both floods in the spring when the snow melt runs down, and droughts in the late summer and fall because we rely on that snowpack to provide us moisture throughout the year. So, and then lastly, we're gonna get more of these whiplash events, like the 2010s, where we go from extreme dry to extreme wet and back again. So, in summary, we're gonna get the overall kind of total decadal or annual average is going to be about the same, but the distribution of how we get that water is going to vary and change and kind of not 
go super well. So Outlook's not, not excellent. Uh, what do we do about it? We can't really change that hazard. And so if we can't reduce the hazard, how can we reduce our damage? And so that's what I'm working on. Here's an example of mapping or translating that hazard to damage. On the left, you see one particular atmospheric river storm. It was a New Year's storm in Sonoma County, which went from, I think, December 30th to January 2nd. It's like a four to five day storm. Uh, they had a pretty bad New Year's Day in Sonoma County that year. Um, but Sonoma's pretty flood prone. This is both a bad storm, but also a pretty characteristic storm for them. And 99% of the flooding in Sonoma County is caused by atmospheric rivers. So you can see the storm doing its thing on the left. And then on the right, we have flood insurance claims, which are used as a measure of damage due to the flooding. So you can see that Sonoma County got hit pretty hard and uh, Napa and kind of up the north coast a little bit had pretty severe damage from this storm, several million dollars. This is a pretty average thing. It's, it's not like a crazy record setting storm here. Um, so in structural engineering, we mapping hazard to damage is something that we're pretty familiar with. And we generally do it with these things called fragility curves, which are pretty conceptually simple. We have some measure of hazard intensity on the x-axis. We have a chance of damage or a percentage of damage on the y-axis. And then you know, as hazard goes up, your probability of getting damaged also goes up. We have these pretty well figured out for earthquakes. Our hazard intensity, intensity measure is ground acceleration, and so you can pretty easily look up for like a two-story wood building, you can expect the curve to look like this, or for a office high-rise, you can expect a curve to look like this. There's been tons of research on that. Same thing for hurricane wind. We measure speed of the wind in miles per hour and kind of how damaged you can expect your building to be. Um, we also have these for storm surge, the depth of the water and how damaged you expect to be. But we don't really have these for rain. And then also, when it comes to rain, that hazard measure is a little harder to define because rain can damage buildings in two different ways. And I broke those out. The first way is top down or infiltration, and then the second way is bottom up or inundation. And so the rain can either make it through your windows or your siding or your roof, or you can live next to a river and have the water table come up and have you know your basement or your first floor flood. And so those are very different things. They're caused by different hazard drivers. They have different kind of, yeah, contributing factors. But when the insurance adjuster shows up, it's treated as water is water and the damage isn't broken out. So given that we really don't have a good way to assess these for rain in any hazard, the only thing we have for water is based on like coastal hurricane flooding. How are we going to measure this for atmospheric rivers? And so that's, that's exactly what my research is, is trying to make this curve, what goes in the hazard side and what goes on the damage side for atmospheric rivers. What I'm working on now is creating a, some kind of hazard proxy variable. So I'm taking the things that we use as kind of secondary measures of atmospheric river intensity, such as rain and river flow levels, as well as things that can contribute to correlated extremes or antecedent factors that might make an atmospheric river worse than it would have otherwise, such as soil moisture. Was the ground dry beforehand, or is the soil already at its capacity and can it not absorb anything else? Is the rain falling on impervious pavement, or is it falling on something that can, you know, accept it? Is it falling on mountains or, you know, plains? So I'm looking at a bunch of different things. I don't know kind of exactly what's going to go in it yet because that's what I'm working on. Uh, but I'm using a combination of kind of physical intuition, what makes sense that could be contributing to flood risk, and things that the literature has said have contributed to flood risk in other places and other kind of applications. And then I'm going through a statistical filtering process to only keep the ones that are important. As for the damage, I'm looking at flood insurance claims from the National Flood Insurance Program. The National Flood Insurance Program writes 90 to 95% of residential flood insurance policies. They're pretty much the 
only insurer for U.S. homeowners on the market. And uh, last spring, for the very first time, they released all of their flood claims online back to like the 1970s. So that's an awesome resource to have that hasn't really been available to resources in the researchers in the past. So I'm working on this hazard proxy variable. I'm working with these damage uh, records through claims, and hopefully I will be able to create the first fragility curves for atmospheric river-induced damage. And then once I have that tool, I'll be able to use it to say, if there's an atmospheric river in the forecast, you can read off this chart and figure out which communities are going to see more damage than others and use that to plan both immediate emergency services and then longer term disaster recovery. And then finally, kind of looking long term, where I see my research going in the future is using these tools, using these measures of atmospheric river hazard and damage to identify the best dollar for dollar flood mitigation techniques. So I've broken it down kind of two different ways. Flood mitigation strategies can either be structural, which is things you build, or non-structural, which is things you do. They can also be prevention, which is trying to stop the water, or reduction, which is trying to make room for the water. So structural prevention techniques are the very traditional dams, levees, flood walls, floodgates. Non-structural prevention are property buyout, so getting people to move away from flood prone areas or elevating their homes so that the water can pass through. Structural reduction techniques are finding ways to store the water, adding retention ponds, adding um, or diverting the water away from places where it could flood a lot of people, so canals and pipes to take water away from urban areas. It also includes kind of urban flood mitigation techniques like permeable pavement and green roofs and things in a city that can absorb water so it's not just running down the roads. And then finally, non-structural reduction includes rezoning, which is not letting people move into flood prone areas. Educational outreach, which is just letting people know that they live in flood prone areas because a lot of times they don't know. Encouraging buying flood insurance restoring natural wetlands and natural kind of land covers that can help with flood capacity. Uh, so there have been a lot of cost benefit studies for these things, but a lot of them are either technique specific or region specific. And again, a lot of them have to do with coastal flooding and hurricane flooding. So I want to do the first atmospheric river specific and California specific cost benefit analysis for these different techniques so that communities can assess their own risk and figure out what the best use of their money is in terms of their flood mitigation. So that's pretty much all I've got. If you are interested in learning more, and if you, uh, yeah, if you found this interesting at all, I would highly recommend signing up for the California Weather Blog. It's written by a Stanford alumni, Daniel Swain. He gives you like a five to 10 minute read every two weeks or so, and it just tells you kind of what's going on, what you can expect in the next, you know, two weeks or month of weather. Uh, if you are ever wondering why the weather is the way that it is, I would highly recommend this. It's a very low commitment. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more of a commitment, these books are both great. Neither of them are about atmospheric rivers. The Water Will Come is about sea level rise, and Building a Resilient Tomorrow is about coastal flooding. But both of them, I think, are great kind of overviews, and they're not too depressing. They give you kind of they, they accept that these things are happening, but then give you some things to do about them. And then finally, if you're interested really in the technical nitty gritty, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes at UC San Diego is kind of the, the top everything for atmospheric rivers. If you go to their website, they've got a ton of papers and they, they know everything about atmospheric rivers. So that's all I got. Thank you for listening. tell the atmospheric rivers, if one side you had like a river on this side and flood on this side, how soon can you tell which rivers are coming? Um, yeah. yeah, there's, I would say you generally know, I'm not a meteorologist so I can't say for sure, but you know, I would say a couple days to a week in advance, you can see them kind of coming on the radar, but sometimes it's hard to tell, it's a little bit like hurricane forecasting where you know it's there but you're not sure exactly which direction it's going to take. 
so having this like cycle of droughts, like severe droughts, and then like very severe rainfall, how might that affect the natural geography and like natural habitats there in California? It's a great question. I know that it's something they're talking about this year because we're gonna have a pretty dry year. We are, all of our reservoirs and stuff are in good condition from the last two years, which has been pretty wet. So in terms of humid and agricultural water use, we're okay. But in terms of ecological things, they're still gonna be affected by drought. And so, I mean, fires are a big thing that you're gonna see more of. Um, I'm not up on exactly which flora and fauna are gonna suffer the most, but I mean, it's definitely probably pretty stressful for the environment generally to have to make it through these abnormal years. There's no kind of stable middle ground for them. It's either one or the other. Um, so when you talk about the hazard proxy variable mm -hmm. and the modeling around quantifying the risk, um, these are obviously aspect of it. I mean, that's a huge part of it because if I am able to make this tool and no one uses it, then that's kind of the point of it. Um, I would say it's, this sounds like a problem, but you convince people more of the time. And so in structural engineering and in hazard management, the idea of fragility curves is really well accepted. And so if I can communicate my tool in the language of fragility curves, and I'm able to say, and also if I'm able to kind of keep the interpretation of these variables clear to a layman. I'm really trying to avoid a black box scenario where you just plug in information and it spits a number out because even though that might be accurate, it's gonna be harder to get people to trust that. So I think uh, keeping it in terms of traditional tools and traditional research that people are already comfortable with and making sure that kind of the path from point A to point B is at least, you know, clear for people to say, oh, the rain is making a big difference and it's not, you know, something random. with 
are not scientists and engineers, and then there are urban planners or community managers. But in terms of the research, I think pre people are pretty well aware. So I think uh, Sonoma County is a great example, or Sacramento as well. Like Sonoma burned this year, but they still, flood mitigation is still very high on their priority list. And it does feel weird because you're like, I'm on fire, why am I worried about my flood risk? But I think that for decision makers are aware and those are the people in research terms that I'm kind of interfacing with the most. Is, uh, are the damages from like, let's say, um, like mudslides incorporated into your curve for damages because they could be directly correlating with like the flooding from that year as well as the, the fires? Mudslides are not, um, and I'm also not looking right now at, I'm looking pretty much only at places where it rains in California. I'm not looking at the mountains where uh, snow is a much bigger thing. So I'm gonna try to solve this problem and then see if I can expand it to other applications. Well, I was thinking like in LA, cause I remember they had like the fires down there and then when it was rainy season, then like all those, those hillsides create, like I guess it's more of like an indirect damage yeah. from flooding, but. Mm -hmm. And kind of back to the regional variation, the, yeah, there are the mudslides in LA, but generally flooding in LA looks very different than flooding does in Northern California. Um, just because Southern California tends to see less rain generally, and so their capacity gets overwhelmed at like a lower threshold, I guess. And so it doesn't take very much rain for LA to flood and for them to get flash flood warnings throughout the city. Whereas Northern California, we're a little more used to it. The floods tend to be less urban flooding and more river flooding. Um, so pretty much everywhere along the Russian River north of the north of San Francisco floods a lot. Um, the Sacramento rivers, the American rivers, kind of east of us have all floods. So yeah, I think my case studies that I've been spending the last six months or so on are Sonoma, Sacramento, Nap and kind of just the north coast area. And so those mudslides haven't really factored in yet. But if I expand in Southern California, then that's definitely something that I think I would have to consider. So you mentioned these atmospheric rivers are kind of like storms, mm -hmm. essentially, right? So do they pose other types of hazards as well, in addition to just this like top-down and bottom-up flooding? Like, can they also mm -hmm. have storm surge or high winds associated with them that you're including? They do have winds associated with them, um, but nowhere near hurricane winds. And they don't tend to cause storm surge because they're not, the way that atmospheric rivers release their water, so hurricanes are, they come from the ocean. And so they kind of bring the ocean with them, if that makes sense. Atmospheric rivers, it rains when it hits a barrier. So the rain kind of stays in that upper atmosphere. It doesn't generally rain as it passes over the Pacific Ocean. The two kind of main barriers it hits is when it hits the coast, and so the coast gets a lot of rain, and then when it hits the mountains and it gets shoved up, and then it rains or snows a lot more there. So storm surge, not really. Wind, kind of, but our structures are pretty well designed against moderate winds. They're not, we're not seeing extreme winds. So I would say that water is pretty much the one that we have to deal with the most. You mentioned you worked for a company for a year uh, before getting into this and you built a tornado model. I'm just curious to hear if there are similarities or differences between the type of work that you're doing there and the type of work you do. Yeah, so I worked for um, Berkshire Hathaway Specialty Insurance and I worked in their catastrophe and engineer catastrophe engineering and analytics group, which is um, basically meant that I worked at an insurance company, but I did no insurance. I didn't do any underwriting or anything. I worked on a team of scientists and engineers. There was people on the earthquake side, there were seismologists, and then on the hurricane flood wind side, we had wind engineers, we had atmospheric scientists, we had meteorologists, 
and there's most of the insurance industry uses these vendor models that are kind of what I talked about earlier. They're very black boxy. You plug in where the structure is, how old it is, how big it is, and it spits out a number like you should write an earthquake insurance policy for $500 a year. And so my team and my company was kind of unusual in that we had a fully staffed 25, 30 person team that was trying to do better than the models. And so like there is a, a tornado model on the market that you can license, but we thought we could do better so we made our own. And so working at that company in particular, I think A was what convinced me to get a PhD because pretty much everything, everybody on my team had a PhD. And I was like, wow, I love this work, and if this is something that I want to keep doing, I should probably go get another degree. Uh, but I think that it also gave me a sense of kind of how important insurance can be and how useful insurance can be to academic research. And so I think a lot of people think of insurance companies as kind of bad guys. Um, and I think in property insurance specifically, insurers are some of the most motivated people to reduce disaster risk. Like they don't want to be paying for your house to be destroyed by a hurricane any more than you want to go through that. So I think that they, but they're not necessarily in a position to do anything about it. They just get kind of quotes in and they write policies. So I think that working in insurance Kind of having that insurance background and having those relationships with insurance has definitely helped me translate that hazard damage and kind of figure out what would be most useful to them. So you mentioned you're really looking at future applications for this research, right? In terms of like identifying these best dollar for dollar like interventions um, to try and decrease this flood risk. Um, and it, so it seems like you're operating kind of entirely within the framework of climate adaptation, right, as opposed to mitigation. So in your cost-benefit analysis, I would be curious, I don't know if you've looked at this at all, to also look at the mitigation side of how much flood risk could we potentially mitigate by spending that money on climate mitigation, just kind of in general. And of course, there's tons of uncertainty and yeah. modeling that you have to do around that as well. But just curious if you had looked at that. And yeah, no, it's something that I have thought about because I'm, most of my research is operating under the assumption that we can't change the hazard that comes at us. And that's obviously not true. Like you can, you know, invest in zero carbon right now and stop that emissions. And, um, but I think that when it comes to funding, a lot of dollars come pre-allocated from the government for like very brick and mortar solutions uh, through things like um, the FEMA National Hazard Mitigation Program and the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Program. Those dollars, communities apply for them, they get those dollars and they can't really be used for climate mitigation. So I think that it's something that I can consider, but in terms of being useful and pragmatic to the people who can use this tool, they generally, the bucket for climate mitigation money and the bucket for climate adaptation money generally cannot and do not cross. And so looking at cost benefit in the context of one of those buckets is gonna be what's most useful to them. How prone to changing are the stability curves that you showed um, due to climate change? So the fragility curves themselves don't change because it's just the, the mapping of hazard to damage. But what you would do with them is like basically you would be pulling a different number off of the hazard. So instead of, um, let's take storm surge for an example. At five feet, I'll have this amount of damage. What's changing is kind of the probability of getting five feet of storm surge. So in 10 years, we may be more likely to get six uh, feet of storm surge. So the curve itself doesn't change, but what numbers you read off of it are gonna be changing. Do you have to ever interact with climate deniers 
climate change deniers who look at separate information and is it more effective or less effective in changing minds? I personally have not interacted with any. I think that might be the California bubble effect. There aren't many kind of people here who are disagreeing with me. Um, I know that kind of in other, there are other researchers at Stanford I know who have done kind of more boots on the ground surveys. They're looking kind of on the more social science side of that and they have run into climate deniers. And it's, uh, it's so polarized that you really have trouble convincing people, especially when you're coming from like the scientific side of things, you what tends to convince people more is much more of an emotional approach. And so it gets back to kind of the importance of science communication and how you share your message um, because all the stats and facts in the world sometimes can't convince people who've got their mind made up. taken a couple classes at Stanford in kind of baseline hydrology, weather, that kind of thing, and I've done a lot of reading. And so I've read, I mentioned the Center for Western Weather and Water Streams, I think I've read every paper they've put out in the last five years, because again, atmospheric river research is small, there's not too many, it, it's a tractable thing to actually read everything, which it really isn't in a lot of fields. Um, so I would say I have had to put in a lot of work to catch myself up on those fronts, but I do think it's valuable to have an engineer, because most of the atmospheric river community right now is meteorologists. And I think I do bring something different to the table as an engineer who came from this very kind of, yeah, structural, like these fragility curves and uh, earthquake research and kind of how structures respond to things I think that brings a different kind of perspective to the table than a lot of people who look at, you know, what the atmosphere is doing. Well, let's give Brian another round of applause. <laughs> and feel free to grab more snacks or stick around. Thank you. 